Hi there. Uh, in this video, we're just going to spend a couple of minutes thinking about some of the key assumptions that lie behind the theory of comparative advantage. Uh, standard trade theory, many of you will cover this as part of your A-level and IB studies. Standard trade theory looks at the theory of comparative advantage, and we can show, based on certain assumptions, that if countries specialise in the goods and services in which they have an advantage, uh, then there can be an increase in uh, consumer and producer welfare uh, and the micro as well as macroeconomic benefits from trade. So the assumptions behind the trade theory are something that's definitely worth knowing a little bit about. And if you challenge and question those assumptions, that can really help your evaluation. Here's a graphic showing five points. I'll go through them each in turn. I shall just slip to the next slide, which basically writes these things down in words for you. So the first assumption uh, is what's known as constant returns to scale. So typically in this model, I think most students use a two country, two products model. We assume constant returns to scale. If we double the output in wheat, for example, uh, we have to if we double the input in wheat, we get double the output in wheat and so on. You move up and down a linear straight line production possibility crunches. Constant returns to scale. However, we know that in, in reality, hopefully if you specialize in something, if businesses try to ramp up their production, they can achieve economies of scale, which could indeed increase, I've used the word there, amp, amplify the gains from trade. So it may be the case if you specialize in a particular industry and you get some economies of scale, then the gains from trade in terms of increased output may be even bigger than the model would suggest. However, of course, there's also the risk of diseconomies of scale, particularly if countries over specialize. The second point in red text, factor mobility, I think is tremendously important. So this model assumes factor mobility between industries, both geographical and occupational. So for example, if a worker was previously working in the farm sector, perhaps producing, who knows, wheat or soya beans, if that worker is then required to shift production over into light manufacturing, then we assume that those workers are perfectly mobile, both geographically and occupationally, between industries, and they are equally productive in whatever industry or job they do. We know, in reality, of course, that we have factor immobility, that oftentimes there are significant barriers to people moving uh, from one job to another, from one sector to another, from one region to another. And one of the features of globalization, of course, is that it has led to winners and losers. So uh, people working in, for example, in the farm sector in the Midwest in the States or people working in textiles in the UK. Uh, the shift of production towards lower cost centers has increased the risk of structural unemployment for many of those people. So factor immobility is a, is a challenge to that assumption and suggests that we may well have to provide some kind of compensation, retraining, for example, to help smooth the waters of, of people who lose their jobs because of trade. Third assumption uh, is that there are no significant trade barriers, tariffs, import quotas, other, any other barrier to trade known as non-tariff barriers. And again, we know in reality that trade is often hampered by those trade frictions, including classic examples, including import tariffs. The model assumes low transportation costs, that uh, getting products to market is not a significant cost across borders. Equally, or you can make a case for saying that logistics costs can be quite high across borders. And that might erode any comparative advantage. Gravity theory would suggest that you tend to trade more with countries in close proximity because the transportation costs are low. And things like globalization, containerization, uh, digital products, of course, they can be moved across borders quickly and easily at fairly low cost these days. The final point is this model tends to assume no externalities or insignificant externalities from production or consumption. In other words, we, we're thinking about the private costs and benefits of trade rather than the social costs and benefits. And again, you can challenge that assumption. Trade oftentimes is a means of increasing externalities. For example, the, the external cost of air freight, for example, or the external cost of, of container ships on the natural habitat and on, on the oceans. So there could be some social costs from increased trade. On the other hand, trade generating the transfer of ideas across borders, the sharing of ideas, information and know-how, 
uh, that can act as a positive externality because th those ideas can, can germinate and can lead to better and more innovative products and processes. So the externalities can be both positive, positive and, ne and negative, but the model assumes they're insignificant. So what's the point of all this? I think the takeaway point is that trade theory is built on certain assumptions. Great idea for the exam to know what those assumptions are and to be able to at least evaluate and challenge maybe a couple of them uh, would help help you answer. Okay, thank you.